Hi, this is Michelle, and today I'm with Brother Mercurio, and we are back talking about Buddhism, the path to enlightenment. Today we're going to talk about a specific type of Buddhism that is very magical. They do things like flying and walking on water. Very interesting. You're going to love this. I know. At first I was like, are you serious? Is this real? And he was like, yes, it is. So, interestingly enough, uh, we're going to kind of get into the history. We're going to talk about it. We're going to tell some stories about it. It's a very, very interesting podcast. Also, too, just a little housekeeping. I want to let you guys know in the bio or the description, depending on where you're listening to this, you're going to be able to find a link to my new book. I finally released my new book. So go to the description or the bio, depending on where you're listening to, and check out the new book. It's available on Amazon. It's called Be Your Own Hero, A Mystical Journey to Self-Love. And if you're into magic and you're into mystery and you're into the intriguing, you're going to love this because this is my story. It's a true story. And I have had so many people reaching out to me that have that have read this book and have told me that they cried through the whole thing. I want you to understand that it was very vulnerable for me to write my story, that I had to really get into some of the deeper issues that I went through to overcome it. So I hope you enjoy it. The link is in the bio. It's available on Amazon. Let's get started with the podcast with Brother Mercurio. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to be continuing our conversation about Buddha, the enlightened path. We are going to get into a little bit more of the esoteric side of Buddhism. This is the part where it gets really interesting because I feel like in this session, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions and just learning more. This is going to be very interesting. Mm-hmm. I have Brother Mercurio here again. Welcome, Hi, Brother everyone. Mercurio. Yeah, I'm going to let you, um, I'm going to just let you kind of start off this because this oh, is sure. kind of your knowledge base, you know, area. <laughs> Yeah, well, hi everyone. Yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about the sort of Mahayana tradition. So there are two Buddhist branches of Buddhism that are the main branches. So, um, and then off of those come various side branches, but the main ones are Theravada, which are the forest based monks that tend to be like around Thailand and these areas in the Far East tend to spend time in forests and meditate and teach the local population and so on, they have temples and so on. Then you've also got the Mahayana tradition, which is the Tibet-based form of Buddhism, um, and that's called the Greater Vehicle, which encompasses things like magic and esoteric practices, as well as you know general forms of Buddhism. Which one is it that actually lives up in the mountains and they kind of seclude themselves? That tends to be more the Tibetan side because Tibet's a very mountainous area Mm -hmm. um, and that region, you know, it's where the Himalayas are, it's where Mount Everest is. So you would get a lot of monks spending time in caves in a mountain. Mm -hmm. Um, And and we can go into that a little more later. But um, they they, they would literally seal themselves up in a cave and someone would bring them food every day. Uh, But they'd be meditating um, solidly, you know, nonstop pretty much. some wouldn't even eat the food for weeks. They'd be in the in the caves, you know. But they wow. would develop incredible powers. Really? You know, so, I, I want to hear about oh, that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you, you hear of people like, um, that you can find on YouTube, actually, if people want to Google it, the Tibetan Buddhist powers. There's, there's a, there was a monk, for example, who can fly, literally, because he's made a connection with a particular deity or being that helps him to fly um, from one village to the other, giving medicine to people. Uh, the thing with Buddhism, it's always connected to helping people. It's always connected to bodhicitta, which is a, is a concept that means compassion and, uh, you know, trying to help all beings, all humans, all, all types of life to improve themselves. And, you know, they, and they have to develop this outlook as part of gaining those powers and so on. So, for example, this guy's a doctor and he, you know, there's a documentary with, um, and the interviewer is saying, well, I can't keep up with him because he just flies from this village to the next and I have to take a, you know, um, a donkey or whatever it is, whatever form of transport he uses to get there. <laughs> and like, 
Um, I mean, is this a, this is a real thing? Is he this alive? This is a real thing. He's, he's, he's apparently alive now. And there's another video of a guy who can basically levitate. He says the right mantras, does the right sort of whatever he's doing in his mind. And you'll see him literally levitate off the, the floor. And that's on, that's a, there's a YouTube video about that as well. So, wow. so they're cool powers. But the thing is, it takes a lot of work to get there. And a lot, it's, it's in a very specific context where they have to develop themselves as a person. You know, you have to develop these powers or, you know, what the Indians call cities, which are basically like psychic and spiritual abilities. Okay. So, so I have a question about that. You know how they say that there's certain areas in the world that can elevate you? They're like magical areas. Mm -hmm. Arizona, for example, you know, there's so many crystals. When I visited Ar oh, Arizona right. personally, I experienced a lot more. My abilities increased. You know, I remember one time somebody had their back was hurting and I just had, held my hand out like this right behind them. And the guy turned around and said, you were sending me energy. He could feel it. My visions were elevated because of the massive amounts of crystals. So I'm just curious as to the mm. Tibetan monks that live in the mountains that are more magical. Are there? Do they, do they position their temples in a certain area that could make that longer? Very likely. I don't know the ins and outs of that to be honest, but um, it's very likely they would choose the right place or be guided to somewhere where they should build it. Uh, that that's probably pretty certain in fact that they probably would receive guidance and um build them in specific places yeah yeah absolutely. I've, I've actually heard that there's murkabas in different areas that are underground oh, wow. that were put in by the mm -hmm. anunnaki or you know they wow. put it underground but they when they traveled and it carries a lot of energy and mm. i even heard that uh that's why they built um pyramids in certain areas and stuff like that okay. because because of that, so I was just curious, like maybe there's a Merkaba under the some of these temples. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, I don't know actually. But, yeah. And there's the whole thing of ley lines, aren't there as well, and you know being built mm -hmm. on energy centers, so it could be mm -hmm. also that. But yeah, so go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so we're talking about the cities, <laughs> the powers, these sort of. So when um, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, which is the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, started, basically Buddhism came from India. You know, because that's where the Buddha grew up, as we talked about in the last podcast, the north of India and um, around that area. So the way it came to Tibet, which was at the time um, kind of a bunch of warring king kingdoms, you know, they, they were just sort of a standard kind of society in those days where they had small kingdoms of um, groups of people. Um, and one of the, the kings had invited um, a super Buddhist, basically, uh, to come over, and he was called Padmasambhava. So he's one of these Mahasiddhas. And uh, mm -hmm. as, as we know, a, siddha, a city is someone who's mastered particular, you know, abilities that enable them to, to have, you know, um, psychic and spiritual powers. So within the, the Mahayana tradition, which is the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there are a number of what you might call, we might call saints or masters, but they called Mahasiddhas. And these key figures did different things within the history, established particular lineages of Buddhist um, traditions and so on and so forth in, in, um, in Tibet. So the first guy that came across to Tibet was invited by the king and he was called Padmasambhava. And he was a particularly uh, gifted individual. He was like charismatic. He had a lot of spiritual powers and magical powers. And of course, this impressed the king. And the king said, well, yeah, I want you to come over here and teach our guys. And um, it led to him, you know, converting a lot of people to Buddhism. Not conversion in the same way that, you know, we, we see that with Christianity and other religions. It was more like people really enthusiastic and they want to learn this stuff, you know. So he established some temples and so on. He also had to integrate it with the local shamanistic tradition, which was, was called Bun or Bon. Um, these guys are also magical practitioners, and they are more indigenous from the local area. And they were initially quite suspicious of Buddhism. Uh, they were kind of concerned this is going to affect the society and cause problems. But what um, Pat Masambhava did was that he, he spoke to them, he you know, established dialogue with them, and integrated a lot of their practices into Buddhism and said, yeah, let's all work together on this. So 
what developed out of that was an incredible sort of mystical tradition in Tibet um, within the, the Mahayana context. So Mahayana means greater vehicle. It's sort of like the, the more formal, a bit like the Catholic Church of Buddhism. And so like a, the, the adepts or the masters, you know? Yeah, I guess. More, they're more formal in their practices, you know, I guess. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Theravada in the other side of Buddhism is more relaxed and it's sort of Mm. They live in forests and are a bit more hippie like, but not, <laughs> not that they're not serious or anything, you know, because they are. They, they have temples, they have their own practices. But, so, um, when you say um, formal in their practices, um, meaning oh, okay. uh, they're, they're like regimented, like at this time we do this, at this time we do this. Yeah. A bit like you'd find in a, in a Christian monastery or something, you know, or a Catholic church. You know, mm -hmm. people follow very particular rituals and, um, you know, it's, certain types of chanting that, that they do for certain festivals. Um, you'll see that if you look at any, you know, Google uh, or YouTube video on um, Tibetan Buddhism, you'll, you'll often see some of these practices, you know, like chants and bells ringing. Even, it's even in the beginning of films, like I think even in, you know, Seven Years in Tibet and there's, there's that film, The Golden Child from, mm -hmm. I think it's from the 80s or something uh, with uh, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> It's so, got some so really is, cool things. What yeah. is the purpose behind all this chanting and and you know bowing and chanting and you know all the stuff that they do all day long? Like, what's the purpose right. of all of that? Yeah. If I so if I start, I'll go through this a bit more about the Mahasiddhas and the lines of Buddhism, okay. and then that should become a bit clearer okay. as we go. So yeah. So basically, from Padma Sambhava, you had a number of other masters coming out that was. People like Tsongkhapa, who was another Mahasiddha. Um, and then you had a very famous guy um, in the Buddhist tradition called Milarepa. And af after the introduction, I'll go into his story more because his story is fascinating. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so from that, basically, um, Padma Sambhava established the first of four branches of Buddhism in Tibet. So there are four very key schools of Buddhism that, that all work together and they have different temples as their basis, or they used to. Um, unfortunately, in I think it was around 19, the 1950s, the Chinese invaded Tibet and destroyed many of the monks and many of the monasteries. So there's a very tragic history um, there. And they, <clears throat> they manipulated the, the local rulers to hand over the, <clears throat> most of the Tibetan countryside to um, China. Mm. And so we have a very difficult situation today, but I, I don't want to go into politics in this particular podcast. People can research it if they want. So the four schools of Buddhism, or the four branches in Tibet, were the Geluks, which is the one with the yellow hats that you've probably seen, and that's the mm. one that the Dalai Lama's part of. So he's from the Geluk school, and that's that was also the school that traditionally many of the rulers of Tibet were part of. Because the Dalai Lama used to be the, you know, like the king almost. He was, he was like the, the guy who was ruling politically as well as spiritually. Mm. Now, um, is he but, part of the magical practice? Like, does the Dalai Lama need to be able to exercise or to do those things? I believe he's he does. He has learned some of that. Uh, his I think his um, branch of Buddhism doesn't study that as much as some of the others. But they all study everything. So they all understand the different branches and aspects of it. Mm. So there's the Geluks, that's number one. There's the Nyingma, which were the first lot to be established by Padma Sambhava, the guy we talked about earlier. And then you've got the Kagyu, who's, which were founded by a guy called Marpa, another Mahasiddha. And then you've got the Sakya branch, um, again, founded by somebody uh, called Drogmi, who was another um, Mahasiddha. And there are various lineages within each of those branches that were founded by different monks at different times. And, um, you know, a lot of those lineages continue to today, um, even though they can't practice fully in Tibet because of the Chinese government. They've moved to India and they've moved around the world. It's actually had the effect of spreading um, Mahayana Buddhism worldwide. I mean, you can find amazing temples in America. There's a great one in Arizona, for example. So, you know, Buddhism spread everywhere, but they have these four schools. Um, they all study things like you know, cities and, and magical practices. And the other very interesting thing is that some of the lamas reincarnate. You know, you probably heard that um, 
the Dalai Lamas basically reincarnate. Every time one dies, they try to find the next one. So, um, you know, you'll get a group of monks who are dedicated to that purpose, and they'll have dreams about, right, it's this village where the next one's going to come along, and they'll go in there and they'll find and test a number of kids that they think might be the next Dalai Lama who's reincarnated. And, you know, one of the tests is to show them their old um, beads and their old ritual implements that they've had among a, a whole pile of them and say, right, pick out your the ones that you had. And very, you know, usually what will happen is they'll find the right ones. They'll pull mm -hmm. them out and they'll say, right, you're the next Dalai Lama, so we'll train you up. They, they bring them... When they're old enough, they'll, they'll agree with the parents when they do that, and then they'll, they'll bring them to um, a temple, and the kid will be looked after, give them royal treatment. You know, they'll be <laughs> um, trained up to be the next leader of a lineage or the Dalai Lama or some other. You know, there are several types of incarnations. And this Dalai Lama has said, I'm not going to reincarnate in Tibet this time because of the Chinese government, so I'm going to reincarnate probably in India or in, in the Western country. So wow. be ready. You know, and he said that very clearly because the problem is the Chinese government is saying they, they want to choose the next Dalai Lama, but they can't because they're not magical and they don't understand it. You know, so um, yeah, you don't get to choose it. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly. Wow. So he says he might even um, reincarnate in the Western countries. Potentially, yeah. I mean, he's not yeah. said specifically where, but he's apparently he has control over where he does incarnate, and it's definitely not going to be Tibet. Wow, so I wonder if that's going to be like the, the, the uh, what do you want to call it, the coming of the Messiah kind of thing, because it'll be in that wow. time frame. That's no, interesting. Right? Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. people, because he's in the Western, they'll think he's the Messiah. Hmm. Could be. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's very interesting. Okay. Well, I'm, watch this, this space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited about this. This is interesting stuff. Okay, go ahead. And there's a number of reincarnations. You know, you'll hear certain lamas, because a lama is like a Tibetan uh, super monk. You know, it's like the, the guys have reached the top and tend to run the temples. Um, there are a number of lamas around who, are, who have the title Rinpoche. And a Rinpoche means they're a reincarnated lama. Mm -hmm. And they'll take on the same name as the previous incarnation and so on. So for each of the lineages, there are a whole range of these, these guys um, who have reincarnated. And the Dalai and Lama, the one that's the Dalai Lama, is always the Dalai Lama. He, he just keeps on yeah. getting reincarnated. the exact same one every time. Yeah, same with the others. There's something, there's a guy called the Panchen Lama. There's, there's, a, um, there's another couple of titles like that, yeah. So um, wow. it, it's part of their tradition. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so you've got these four branches of Buddhism, basically, um, in the Mahayana tradition. The, the more magical side of it tends to be called Vajrayana, which is a subcategory, and, and all of those traditions study it. <clears throat> and Vajrayana is all about, like, um, Vajra means thunderbolt, and it's all about, like, a rapid way to enlightenment. You know, theoretically, if you follow this properly, you can become enlightened within one lifetime, that's what they say. Mm. But you have to do some very intense exercises, and this is when they do stuff like shut themselves in a cave for for, you know, 10 years or whatever it is and do intense meditation. Um, or this guy I'm going to talk about in a minute called Milarepa, who um, he basically did that. You know, he, he eventually shut himself in a cave and then he came up with all sorts of powers like generating heat and like being able to walk naked in the mountains during the snow and you know, there's lots of things. He could walk on water, you know, a lot of stuff like that he developed after his time. <clears throat> so, so it's very interesting. It's it's very very cool. So, shall I go on to talk about him? Yeah, I would love to hear about him. All right. So his story is very interesting because he started out as a what nowadays you might call an evil magician or a dark magician. So what happened was he was born into a family that was very wealthy, um, and he had a great life until his father died, and. At that point, his uncle and aunt took over um, the family home and took all the wealth. Uh, and his mother was very resentful of all this. So she apparently said to him, go and train as a magician and we can get our revenge and get all our wealth back. You know, So he went off and he did very well. He trained as a magician. 
breakfast in probably in the local bond tradition or something like that. They'll be, you know, one of the the um, branches of magic at the time. And he learned how to um, basically cause people to die, you know. <laughs> so one of the things apparently he did is he brought a whole ton of rocks to fall on his uncle and out of the sky. And um, he ended up destroying a lot of people, apparently, or murdering people. And what was his, like, training? Like, what was his background? Well, people don't really know. I'm, I'm guessing it might be in that burn tradition, because they, they, would, they were the first magical tradition in Tibet, mm. who, who were not Buddhists, but they were, you know, pre, pre-Buddhism. And they were very skilled, you know, skilled magicians. Mm. People used to come from all over the world to train with them. But I don't know for sure, because there's very little written about it, you know, about his history as a person. It's more this sort of legend. Yeah, so basically after a while he, he became quite remorseful and he thought, no, I shouldn't be doing this. It's not it's wrong. You know, I shouldn't be using it in this way. Um, and so he, he decided he wanted to become a Buddhist student. And so he became a student of Marpa. Was there anything that happened that actually kind of made him have a consciousness? I think because he killed his uncle. And even though his mum didn't like his uncle and wanted that, um, he regretted it afterwards. I mean, this is my uncle I've killed. How, you know, I shouldn't, this is wrong, you know. So I think he had a bit of a realisation after that. Um, mm. And he wanted to fix it. He wanted to, um, and they believed in karma and things already. So I think he probably started thinking, wow, this is what's this going to do for my future lives. You know, I've done all this. Um, so he went to see um, a master called Marpa. And Marpa basically said to him, I'm not going to teach you. You know, you don't deserve it. You know, you've done all this stuff. And then he kept going back to him and saying, no, please teach me, please teach me. And he said, well, okay, I'm going to test you first. So go and build me a tower. So he had to go and build him this meditation tower or something. And he said, no, I don't like that. Knock it down. Like, build me another one. <laughs> you know? And he did this about four times. And part of it was to break down um, Milarepa's ego because he recognized actually Milarepa is doing this because he th thinks he's so powerful. You know, he thinks, oh, look at me, I'm a powerful magician. So Marpa's tactic was to say, well, you've got to come back to, to base again. You've got to not get rid of your ego and start practicing, you know, type thing. So he forced him to do these various tasks, which are really massive, but apparently that's what he thought, he thought um, Milarepa needed to, to break him, really, and bring him back to, to a level where he could actually study. So eventually he did that, and he got through these trials. He, he built three towers, and then the fourth one is still standing. You can find it um, in a place called, I think it's called Lodra, and it still, it still stands today. It's a four-story tower. So it's quite interesting. Um, so eventually he was accepted after this, and um, Minarepa was told, right, now you need to go off into the mountains and meditate. So he sent him off to do what they normally do, and they had, he had to go for years up there, you know. Um, but in, in return, he got a whole number of um, tantric initiations, because tantra is a big part of Buddhism, and it, it's not the, what in the West we think tant tantra is just a sexual thing, but it's not. It's like a, it's a whole practice around unifying the masculine and feminine within you, and like around um, developing magical abilities and so on by connecting your energies in the right way. So he, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but that's essentially what he was taught when he was initiated into this particular um, line of practice. And he, get, he was given all sorts of instructions. He was taught how to purify his negative karma. Um, and he became a master of, of Tantra. However, there were still a number of things that they needed to learn. So him and his his teacher both went to India to get the final teachings because in India was still considered to be the source of Buddhism and the source of a lot of these practices and they, they still do it today really um, so he got that and then he he came back and became part of the Kagyu tradition which is one of these four categories and he started teaching Vajrayana Buddhism as well you know um, but the the classic things about him is he, he mastered a particular technique called Tummo. And again, you can Google that. Tummo is a practice where you generate heat in your body. 
and the monks that do it, they still do it now in Tibet, in Tibetan monasteries and mm -hmm. around the world. They can basically walk in the cold weather and they won't feel it, you know, or they'll they'll be told in the beginning when they're learning it to go and sit out in the snow with basically naked, just in your underwear, um, and do the practice. And they find they can generate this heat. And they'll even put wet cloths on them, and you'll see the steam rising off because they're generating this heat um, within them. So he was a master of this practice. So he basically used to walk around half naked in the snow, and people would be, you know, in the mountains, and they say, "Oh, oh my gosh, what are you doing?" You know, <laughs> it's like he's standing there with. Wow. Uh, and the other power he was meant to have had that he demonstrated was to walk walk on water. Mm. So he apparently could just do that, you know. He goes, "Oh yeah, I can get myself into a state in the whatever he had to do to do that, and he'd be able to just walk across a lake or, or whatever." Um, so, you know, those people who say Jesus lived in India and went to Tibet may be right. Maybe he learned these things there. I don't know. Who knows? Well, it uh, sounds like it. I mean, basically, <laughs> Jesus walked on water, you yeah. know, and um, he was so a very he powerful healer. So. <laughs> I mean, goodness mm. gracious! This is this is uh, this is really yeah. quite fascinating. So he's an, he's he's one of these Mahasiddhas. He's one of the, the Buddhist saints that everyone talks about. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a lot of songs. He's a poet, um, and he he's a yogi. I think he called himself a Tibetan yogi. Basically, there are different types. You know, there are the formal monks in the monasteries who wear all the yellow and red gear. That you've probably seen, and then there are there's a branch called Ngapka who tend to live in the world, and he was one of those. He was more like a yogi that would, you know, uh, wear what he wants and live in the world after he trained, um, but he would still go and teach in the monasteries. So he was known as a yogi, and a lot of the the modern Ngapkas now, like I have a teacher of Buddhism who is a, is one of these. He's an Ngapka, and he lives in in the West. You know, just walks Wait, around in all, normal clothing. You have a teacher that's a Buddhist? Yeah, I have a Buddhist teacher as well. I did not know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's a really interesting guy. Um, I can send you his website later on if you like. But, um, yeah. What, well, what so form now of Buddhism are you learning? They do that now. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry? What form of Buddhism are you learning? So it's called Drikun, Drikun Kagyu. Mm -hmm. Kagyu. Yeah, I think I said it right. <laughs> so okay. it's like a branch of the Kagyu tradition at the moment that I'm just beginning to learn about. It's very interesting. It's, I wouldn't say that I've um, mastered it, but I'm I'm fascinated by it. So I'm trying to just you know find out more and understand. What, is this is this part of that? Is it part of that magical part, or is it the um, it is? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's. So, so you're going to learn how to fly and walk on water. Well, that's the plan eventually, you know. I don't know. <laughs> who, who knows? I'd love to, but I don't I think... I knew there was a plan involved here. <laughs> From what he says, it can take up to 20 years, so, you know, I don't know, more. So wow. It's, wow. Not gonna be, it's not a quick process. In Buddhism. Because you've, the other thing is, which will probably clarify some of your earlier, earlier questions, is that you have to work on yourself first. You've got to get yourself out of the way before you can understand these powers. So they give you a lot of exercises to do that in the beginning. Um, different practices, visualizations of, you know, Buddhas, visualizations of um, particular environments that are around you. Uh, they give you different um, mantras to chant as well. It's a bit like in the Golden Dawn, you know, you have this, this concept of names and images. By names and images, all things are created and recreated. Um, it's the same for them. So it tells me that's, that is a key mechanism in in mystical traditions, really, is you need to be able to visualize, you need to be able to chant or, or to say or vibrate particular names and sounds. Um, and also, you have to train your mind. And the big thing in Buddhism, obviously, is to become more compassionate. So there's, there's ways that they train you to do that. So, um, for example, there's a great book called The Words of My Perfect Teacher, which is a very old, ancient Buddhist book. And in that, um, there's an exercise where you have to Consider every time you, you make a negative remark about somebody, you, you have to say to yourself, no, that's, that could have been my mother in a past life. Mm. That person could be. And it stops you. It has a really weird effect. Um, you know, I'm doing that all the time. And, uh, it, you know, my friends are laughing at me because I, I, I'll start, I'll catch myself saying, oh, yeah, 
criticizing somebody or something and I'll say and they're my mother so I can't do that, <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> so it's, uh, um, but it's, wow. a, it's a it's a really good exercise to make you think differently isn't it you know mm -hmm. so they have a whole range of things like that that they teach there is something I'm curious about Buddhism kind of talking about karma mm. Yeah, there, karma's a big thing. Sometimes there's these theory out there that if if you incarnate as a a gambler in one lifetime, mm. the next lifetime you're gonna incarnate as a an accountant. You know, so it's like you're gonna go from one extreme to the next extreme so you can neutralize mm. the the karma balance within yourself, you know, about mm. your your feeling and um perception of money. And yeah. It's like one just gambles it away, another one misers it away, and then eventually mm -hmm. putting the two together, you come up with a nice balance. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, how does Buddhism feel about karma? Do they see it the same way or do they see it more like you did a bad thing and this is going to happen to you? I think it's a mixture of both. They certainly see it as very significant. And some of the preliminary practices before you can start anything serious in, in a Buddhist tradition are about resolving your own karma and trying to purify yourself from past karma and other things. And to, the other thing is you have to do start to be able to identify what seeds you're planting that might become, you know, uh, give you a karmic response in a future life. So being very careful what you say, because even thoughts and words can be karma, you know, um, hence the mother exercise, I guess. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but also there are things you would have done in past lives that might be causing problems for you now mm -hmm. you know so for example you you might marry somebody who you suddenly start having a lot of conflicts with and then you find out perhaps through meditation or seeing a medium that you knew that person in a previous life and you harmed them perhaps or they harmed you so you but the, that act of harming them or them harming you has attached you to them so you have to encounter them in a future life in order to somehow process and resolve that which may or may not work you know hopefully you you have some sort of recognition and you resolve it by making peace with them but sometimes people don't and then the karma continues to the next life you know until you do it it's almost mm -hmm. like you have to keep experiencing things till you've learned the lesson it's quite a complex thing i think wow that's really interesting so so it really does matter what you do in yeah. that tradition, it does. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's um, interesting. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, they, they might say, you know, we were destined to meet on this podcast because we had some connection in a past life, perhaps, or somehow it, it led us through the ages to this point, or, or something like that. You know, you might have other meetings with people or random things that appear random, but actually they're not because, you know, it's a karmic thing. Um, or illnesses. You know, you might find someone has a particularly incurable illness. And it's come about due to previous karmic actions or thoughts. Um, and it's got to be worked out through the body for some reason. I mean, who knows exactly why, but, you know, it has to come through the body, which is why it can't be healed easily or, or at all until that person resolves the karma. And I presume if they knew enough Buddhist exercises, they could resolve their karma and then the illness would go. But it wouldn't be able to be healed by normal means. So there's things like that that come into it. So it's mm. um it's quite quite fascinating really, yeah. So how did you find the Buddhist master, and how did the, I would like to hear that story? Like how did that happen? Because I didn't. This is all new. Oh and yeah, no, we happen? haven't talked about that. I don't even know how you have the time to do all this. You have the church <laughs> that you run. You also have all these other responsibilities with this other temple. You mm. have students. You have the podcast, and now you got Buddhism and you work. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I do wonder myself how I do it all, but um, I think life somehow makes space for these things, you know, and you're meant to to meet these people. They just come into your life, you know, it just randomly um, happens. And is that what and happened like, with you? You just randomly bumped into a monk? I, well, I was meditating and I was at some point and I was thinking I'd really like to learn more about this stuff. And as often happens to people in our tradition, you know, you will attract things into your life that you want to do and they, they'll just happen so um yeah i was just um looking online and i was looking around this concept of buddhism partly 
you know, when I was researching for the show last time and stuff like that. And I came across this guy and uh, we started talking and he said, yeah, you can be my student. So I, I started um, learning with him, really. So, yeah, it kind of came that way. And then, wow, you know, there's this um, Buddhist monastery that I've connected with. So there's a, there's a number of, yeah. You, it's you know that thing when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. I think it's like that. You know, the, that if you put it out there that you feel ready, you want to learn something, it'll happen. It'll just, and you have to trust, you know, that that it happens, um, and you'll feel right about it. But obviously, don't just accept anyone that comes into your life because you don't know. But just um, and make sure and be sensible and all of that. But learning how to walk on water, you know, <laughs> do all. I would love fly, to do that. <laughs> fly. Well, that would be neat. You wouldn't even have to have a car. So this is also to do with Milarepa, this guy that I was mm -hmm. telling you about, the the, um, the famous master who could walk in the snow and generate heat. Um, so there's a story that um, long after he died, people were looking at the cave that he used to meditate in. It, you know, it's become, they've built a monastery around it now, and it's, it's a famous cave in Tibet that you can visit, in fact, where he was. Um, so people were investigating this cave and they found um, a song that he left because he was like a, he used to write poems and, and songs. There's, there's a thing, I think there's like a hundred songs of Midarepa or something you can, you can get online. Um, so they found this scrap of rice paper um, and it had his handwriting on it. And they were reading that um, they kind of looked into it more closely, and they found, I think it was on the back or some detail that he'd said that he'd written there in his own handwriting that beneath a nearby boulder is buried all the gold that he hoarded during his life, right? So they thought, oh, well, treasure, you know, like humans are. It's like, oh, wow, look, I've got to find the gold. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so quite a few of his sort of people who'd become his disciples in a way, I guess, many years, many, many years later, because he was born, I think, in the like 10th century. Oh, wow. So, yeah, many, but his traditions continued for many thousands of years. So, um, these disciples dug around and everything, and then under, they found this rock, and under the rock, they discovered a ragged cloth bundle, like this thing wrapped in cloth. So, they pulled at the knots and they tried to open it, and they, you know, shaking their, their hands were shaking, and they, they kind of eventually got it open, and then there was another layer, so they had to open that one. And then they found this big lump of dried shit. <laughs> Sorry to swear on my like dried dung. <laughs> oh so, my god! Yeah, and there was another note inside scribbled then, and what it said was, "If you understand my teaching so little that you actually believe I ever valued or hoarded gold, then you are truly heirs to my shit." <laughs> <laughs> oh my god now that is funny yeah and it, he signed it you know the laughing badra milarepa that was his signature on it oh. so he left his disciples this message you know but basically it was another form of teaching you know to help them realize that actually material you know gold's only not worth anything spiritually wow that is so yeah. amazing Okay. <laughs> in the Buddhist tradition, with the, all of the magical powers that some of these guys mm. can acquire, that takes 20 years to learn. Mm. But uh, what are the possibilities? Like, what can they? What can, like, what's mm. the extent of that? Like, can you can you move a mountain? You know, by waving your hand, or you know, can you change the weather? Can you like yeah. the rain or? Can you, uh, or is it energetic? Can you use your mm. mind to attract things like manifesting? Maybe they would define it differently, you know, but, um, I'm just yeah. curious, like, what is the, um, possibilities and okay. So what he learned were what the, the Hindu tradition calls the cities, which is why they're called Mahasiddhas, you know, they're masters yeah. of city. Um, and what the cities, are basically our abilities to manifest supernormal powers. So they describe things like flying through the air, walking mm -hmm. through solid objects, diving into the ground, walking on water, um, and basically you can change one element into another in order to do it, apparently. So you have to master particular forms of meditation before that's possible. But these are some of the things that have been written about. And obviously for him, generating heat was one. Um, making imprints on solid rock 
and things like that, really. So it's like you're, you have a mastery of the elements is what it looks like. Yeah. Um, this is really interesting. I had this, um, mm. I had this uh, student one time was telling me some stories. She studied with one of these guys. Mm. She was going, she went through the initiations that you're talking mm. about. I don't know. There's like seven or eight or probably something yeah. like there's a lot. There's several different levels. She said that, uh, one of the, one of the beginning levels, he was trying to break down her ego. She kept on like debating him on wow. challenging him on a few things. And he went like this and he pushed her, just went like this and touched her head, mm. you know, with his hand. And she said she went into the ground into wow. the earth, and she was in there and she was in there and under the ground with the worms. You know, and she said, she, then he like grabbed her and then he ended up pulling her out. Mm -hmm. it, it was really interesting because I'm thinking about like what you're saying. And I'm thinking about with some of the stories that she told me. So how long have you been doing this Buddhism thing? This is very new for you. Uh, yeah, fairly new. Yeah, I mean, I've always been interested in it. And many years ago, I started off with Zen. So I, I, I practiced Zen for from in my 20s for wow. a good well, ever since, really, I suppose it never really leaves you. And uh, yeah, just recently, I've been connecting with these this other aspect because I'm I'm just curious to find out more and to to do these practices. But obviously, you know, I don't know if I have another twenty years, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but what I did want to tell you, um, to end with, one of the key things that they also look at in Tibetan Buddhism is preparing for your death. And like, it's a you know, you've probably heard of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole set of practices around preparing for death and making sure that you, when you die, you set things right so that you're incarnated in a, in a better place. You're not going to come back in one of the, I think they have like 90 hell regions or something or several thousand regions of hell. So to make sure you're not born in one of those, you, you follow certain practices. Um, and also for some of them, particularly the masters, I think they can influence where they might be born next. So, Wait a second. So they believe that you can be born in hell? In a hell. They have a concept of hells um, and a whole range of different hells that you could potentially uh, be born like, in according meaning, to your karma. Meaning on earth or like in a dimension? A dimension, like, perhaps. Like, yeah. a, like hell and brimstone type thing? I, I guess so. I don't know enough about it, honestly. But um, mm. it's written in these books. So a lot of it's about facing your own death. And there's there's a particular mystical practice. Um, called Dzogchen, which is part of the, the esoteric practice of Buddhism. And what that's about is getting to the point where you can just dematerialize. Instead of dying physically, you can um, reach a point where you touch on the supreme essence that's within you, and it can lead to, uh, I think they call it rainbow body practice, which is eventually where you can change your atoms literally into a rainbow, and then you... you you know, presumably you go into another world. But, you know, I'd love to achieve that. I, I don't want to die. Oh, no, no that. kidding. I, honestly, <laughs> I've, heard of, I've heard of like all these different masters, high level masters that mm. have said, okay, I'm going to die now. Yeah. And just like decide and then they go. Oh, absolutely. Like, oh. Yeah. It would be, I mean, there's a monk at the moment um, you can find on YouTube, and I forget what he's called, but he uh, was in a cave for. 20 years and then he came back and started teaching and the Dalai Lama said to him this our current Dalai Lama said to him please don't let yourself go yet because we need you to teach people for for another 10 years or something so he said okay I'm not going to die yet I'll stay you know because he could he had the power to choose when he, he would go so he he agreed now you've asked me okay because you're the Dalai Lama I'm going to stay and teach people for longer so I think that's possible people do have that ability to um Okay, I want that ability. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, yeah. yeah, I would like to, like, just mm. turn into a whole bunch of sparkles and just float away. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like Kung Fu Panda, isn't it? I think that's what happened to, to his master, yeah. <laughs> uh, I know, it'd just be really cool mm. to kind of, like, just dissolve and just yeah. fly away and see all these beautiful, like, sparkles yeah. flying, like, in the air, you know, traveling away. Yeah. But it doesn't, it just proves to you, doesn't it, that we can master ourselves. We can master our life and our body and our elements. You just have to follow the right track. And, um, you know, now is the time. Start, 
you know, I think everyone out there, start working on yourself, start improving yourself. That's the way forward. And then eventually you'll reach a point where you can do this. Well, I think I think that there's um, there's a lot of different traditions that that mm. teach magical practices to elevate your yeah. consciousness and uh, you know to be able to master. But every single one of them makes mm. you master your mind first. Mm. It's like you've got like with a golden dawn, you have to go through this whole alchemy to master. Yeah. You know, go through the self mastery of getting everything balanced within you. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. your thoughts, your feelings, your passion, your anger, your uh, everything. And I think, um, from what you're talking about, even with the, with the Buddhism, there's, you know, there's mm -hmm. a level that you have to even be in before you can get to a certain point with them. Mm -hmm. But even yeah. at that, they make you go through this whole alchemical shift mm -hmm. of through their practices yeah. that they, which is really, that's very fascinating to me. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. I Thank you. Love yeah. Yeah. You guys will uh, see you on the next episode. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. This is Michelle. And I just want to thank you for listening to this podcast. And I just wanted to let you guys know that my book is finally released. Be Your Own Hero, The Mystical Journey to Self-Love. So here's a sneak preview, a little bit about it. And if you go into the description, you'll find a link for the book. The story is about a time in my life when I felt like my life was loveless. I didn't even really know how to comprehend the meaning of love or what it felt like because I had never been loved. Now, granted, I had family members and family and all of that, but as far as like really truly understanding what love was, I had no comprehension of it because I'd never felt it. And so I go on this journey and I start praying all the time. And I used to live on the lake and I would go out at night and I'd stare at the stars and gaze into the lake and I'd pray. And I'd pray and I'd pray and I'd pray and I'd pray and I'd pray. And, I'd pray. and I would ask God, please, Please send me somebody that will love me, you know, bring love into my life. And so one day I was outside and I was against this tree and I was just crying and begging God, you know, please, please help me. I'm out there I'm begging God, looking at the stars, sitting behind this tree that had like a double trunk. Suddenly I hear this voice that says, go and meditate. And so I rush inside thinking, oh my goodness, God's going to give me the answers. He's going to tell me how I'm supposed to find my new love, how this is about to happen for me. I was fixing to get a message. And when I went to go meditate, I, I couldn't concentrate. And so I was frustrated because I felt like, oh no, I'm not going to hear God's voice. He's not going to give me those answers. So I sat up in the bed because I thought that I heard something going on in the bathroom. It sounded like water was running. And in my mind, I thought maybe my teenage son had used the wrong bathroom. So I sit up in the bed and I see this man standing in the doorway. And imagine that you're sitting there in your bed and there's this man standing in the doorway. And in my mind, I knew immediately that it was a visitation. He started to approach me and said, I have a message for you. You need to write a book about love. Instead of being scared, <laughs> He even asked me if I was scared. Why aren't you scared? And I said, oh, because I've got crystals everywhere. I've got this place like so cleansed and you wouldn't be able to enter here if you weren't, you know, godly. So I'm ready for this grandiose message about how I'm going to find love. And instead, he tells me to write a book about love. Just imagine how frustrated I might have been. I was so frustrated. I told him he picked the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> and oh my god this started this whole journey for me because in the end I ended up asking for him to bring me back a messenger I went back and prayed about it and the kind of messenger I ended up getting that worked with me for three years ended up being a monk it is the most amazing mystical beyond comprehension story that you will ever hear and 
It took me years to write this. I mean, this happened like 20 years ago. It was a long time ago. I had the hardest time with actually writing this story. I wrote it over and over again, this whole three-year you know, journey that I went on with this monk and all the spiritual things that happened in this this elevation of consciousness that happened to me. It took me a really long time because I felt like it was such a vulnerable place for me to get into. I was afraid if I told the story that I would get judged. That, you know, the more conservative religious people would basically start, you know, putting crosses on me or something. In the very beginning of the book, I really kind of let people know that I was very, very Christian. And, but I also believed a little bit of esotericism and I, I had um, this idea that God could talk to you. And I had heard it. I had heard God's voice before. So for me to get a visitation, for him to send me a messenger who I thought was an angel, you know, to show up or to actually put somebody in a body to teach me and help me to bring this love into my life, to show me how to write this book, to tell me what the message was, you know, to to take me down this journey ended up um, being something that really surprised me. So I think you're going to really enjoy this book and understand <laughs> it took me like a long time to write this because I was petrified, but I finally let go of my fear and decided the message needed to be put out there. That mysticism, magic, miracles, the power of prayer, it's real and it can happen for anyone.